Okay, when we, when we talk about history, there's a lot more to history than uh, memorizing names of presidents, dates, wars. History start with you this morning. It started with mere fact that we are alive today. So yesterday is today's history. History starts with what you ate this morning. It started with our grandma's recipes. And for a lot of us, it starts in the history of the cemeteries. The history of my family, and I'm sure many families in here, can be traced to the cemeteries of the black churches. Black History Month was started by Carter G. Woodson in 1926. And it's, it's to focus on the studies of Negro life and history. So it went from one week to one month. But as we move forward, black history, our history, is every day. So having given that introduction, I would like to call upon Ms. Casey from Maryland National Capital Park and Planning. Park, Maryland National Capital Park and Planning is responsible for designating the historic districts uh, in Prince George's County. So I'm going to set the stage for you and you. enlighten us. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you everyone for having me. Can you hear me okay yes. back? Okay, great. Um, so thank you, Mr. Rumi, for inviting me to participate. My name is Casey Roan. I'm a historic preservation planner with the Prince George's County Planning Department, part of the Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission. Um, I'm also a graduate of the University of Maryland's uh, Historic Preservation Master's Program, where when I was a student, I was able to participate in a research project here in Fairmount Heights as one of my graduate courses. So I'm really glad to be back here in the community again today. And, and thank you for welcoming us to participate in this event. Um, and happy Leap Day, because I haven't had the chance to say that to anyone yet. Uh, we are part of the planning department, so we are um, functioning within a land use agency. But our job is to um, is to work with the history that's reflected in the land in the built environment. So we're looking at preserving places that tell the stories of the histories of the county and its communities and its people. And that has changed a lot over time and it's continuing to evolve today. But that is the, the mission that our, our organization within the planning department was founded with. So we operate within a framework, within a legal framework that was established through county law, through state law, and through the whole federal historic preservation program. So within Fairmount Heights, there are three types of historic resources, historic places that our office is concerned with. And those are historic sites, which are regulated by the county's historic preservation ordinance and are protected um, and governed by the Historic Preservation Commission historic resources, which are recognized for their historic potential, but haven't been elevated to that status of historic site yet. Um, and then there is the National Register Historic District, which comprises about 144 acres uh, within the town of Fairmount Heights. Um, and it's bounded roughly by Eastern Avenue, 58th Avenue, Sheriff Road, Balsam Tree Drive, and 62nd Place. And so the National Register District for Fairmount Heights was listed in 2011. And it came out of an effort um, that was done in the early part of the 21st century, about 2003, I think. The county did a, a countywide study of African American heritage and associated resources. And this was sort of the culmination of an effort to fill a lot of gaps in the history that we were telling and the, the places that we recognized as important around the county. So this really brought forward a lot of sites associated with African American history that hadn't been recognized before. And that research laid the groundwork for the designation of this historic district in 2011. So as a National Register district, um, it includes 562 resources, uh, 298 of which are contributing, which means that they they retain their sort of essential physical essence that allows them to, to tell the story of why they're significant. So those are the buildings within the district that allow, you can look at them and sort of get a sense of the history that they're telling. Um, and so the National Register, that's our nation's list of the sites and districts that are considered important at a national level to the history of the country, the state, or, or the localities. And 
places are listed on the National Register under a number of different criteria that are laid out in that federal law. And so when the Fairmount Heights District was listed in 2011, it was identified as meeting criterion A, which is that it is associated with events that have made a significant contribution to the broad patterns of our history. So that means it helps tell the story of the, the evolution of the, the nation and the county in sort of a, a broad way. And within that broad criteria, there were three areas of significance that were pulled out as being particularly important. Uh, and I'll talk about those in a little bit more detail. So the first area of significance that Fairmount Heights was found to, to exhibit was community planning and development. And the important thing to remember with these is that, again, we're, we're a land use agency. We're concerned with physical places. So what I think is interesting about these criteria are the way they point to specific parts of the physical environment that help to tell this history. So for community planning and development, it was found that Fairmount Heights conveys the development patterns of the earliest African-American subdivisions in Prince George's County. Um, and so if you look at a, a map of Fairmount Heights, I have sort of a, a property map here where you can see all the little parcels within the town. And you can see, based on the way the town developed, that the scattered placement of dwellings within the community was very typical of the way that African-American suburbs developed in the first part of the 20th century, where lots were sold and houses were built as the financial means of owners allowed. So rather than a bunch of houses being built in a row, they were you know, sort of built more sporadically. If you look at the map, you'll also see that a lot of the lots are pretty standard size of about 25 by 150 feet. And that's pretty consistent across the town. And that was seen as characteristic of the tendency of African-American subdivisions that were marketed in the form of these smaller lots that could be, you know, one lot could be purchased or more lots could be purchased and assembled together if somebody had the means to build a bigger house. And then even though Fairmount Heights was platted four years later than North Brentwood, the community here evolved to be almost three times larger in size. Uh, and retained a greater number of non-residential sort of community-oriented buildings. So those were all features of the landscape that were picked out in the historic district as representing the significance of community planning and development. The next area of significance was in politics and government. So Fairmount Heights contains the houses of notable individuals who played a significant role in the political history of Prince George's County and the community, including William Sidney Pittman, I'm sure all of you probably know this, this history a lot better than I do, but he's known for organizing the first civic association erecting a so to erect a social hall and designing the first community school. And his house was unfortunately lost in 2013. Um, but another resource that's still standing is the Doswell Brooks House. This is one of our county historic resources so that we have some authority over. And uh, Mr. Brooks was the first African-American member of the County Board of Education very active in local politics um, and served as a uh, member of the town council and mayor from 1955 until 1965. And so his house is still standing. And because of its um, status as a historic resource, that means it could someday, and that, I mean, this is true of something that's not a historic resource as well, but it could someday be elevated to that status of historic site and be given the, the full protection of the historic preservation ordinance. Uh, and then the other area that was called out within politics and government was that it, the town's proximity to D.C. made it a center of political activity with notable early Republican club meetings and um, early uh, voter registration drives. The third area of significance that was called out in the district was broadly significant to African American heritage. So recognized as a place that was specifically settled by African Americans who were seeking homeownership in a climate and in a community that would allow them control over their own lives in a broadly you know, racist and segregated society that existed at the time. Um, so it's noted that early residents worked together to develop their political and social institutions as a haven from that surrounding hostility. That there are surviving community places, and I hear I called out the Grace United Methodist Church on 59th Avenue, which is one of our designated historic sites. Um, places like this provided services to the community and conveyed the web of kinship and solidarity that the local citizenry developed. 
Um, this one I thought was interesting. So it was noted that physical changes to the dwellings and the replacement of older houses with newer buildings where in some places that might be seen as detrimental because some of those older resources were lost. But this identified that as a, as a, a facet of that significance because African Americans commonly remodel or replaced older houses rather than moving out into another community, they improved on the, the house and the lot that they had. So that's seen as an element of the significance here. And finally noted that Fairmount Heights has been continuously occupied by African Americans since the time of its initial subdivision in 1900 um, and through its incorporation in 1935 until today. And so that, that's like a brief thumbnail of the National Register District. What we deal with on the day-to-day -day in our office in historic preservation and planning is, is more to do with the local uh, historic sites and historic resources. And I think we recognize that these aren't perfect tools and they're sort of bound by the, the preservation laws that we have. But I would say that I think over time, preservation has evolved to strive more for equity and inclusivity and representation in the types of resources that we're preserving and the histories that we're sharing. So I think that our, the goal of our office is to be a resource to the residents um, and communities of Prince George's County seeking to preserve places that are important to them. And we have a lot of tools at our disposal to do that, both with formal historic property designation and then through a host of other means that are available through our office, like our, our grant programs, um, both in preservation and in other areas of the planning department. And I left some information about those at the back. Um, and those can include research on your historic house or we can work with you towards designation of your property if that's something that you're interested in. And um, we have uh, funding available to produce publications like some of the materials that you see around the room today, like I think this little walking tour and the brown booklet. Um, those are the types of things that could be produced with funding through our non-capital grant program. So please let me know if that's something that you're interested in. Um, and then finally, um, you mentioned at the beginning the sort of connection to um, heritage through cemeteries and burial places. And that's a major focus of our office is identifying uh, cemeteries um, around the county. So we're working to find those places and to document them. So if you are concerned about a cemetery in the county, that's another thing that we would be interested in, in hearing about and working with you on. Um, so I have some cards back there. I would love to, to speak with you and get to know you more and talk with, about you with what we can do to continue working um, on this physical aspect of preservation of the important history that you, you have here. And, and thank you for having us. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Moving right along, um, first order of business, yes, we do have lunch. We can bring it out in a few minutes. Hi, I'm not brown bag, but a box lunch. So I do have lunch. Um, so we're going to move right along. So, uh, and I think maybe before they do that, let's do a brief introduction so, so you know who's in the room. So I don't really know everybody. So let's start here. Okay. All right. Um, hello, everybody. I'm Tony Ruffin. Uh, manager of External Affairs and Government Relations for PEPCO. Sunira benton Ake, I'm the manager for project execution for PEPCO as well. Okay, let's go this way. Okay. Mm -hmm. Tanya Morris, former resident here with my husband, Ed Slash Curtis Morris. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm her driver. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we're looking forward to the presentation. And then on the background, uh, Pinkney, Tony Forsman. Okay. Oh, my name is James Pinkney. I'm the Court Enforcement Officer for the Town of Thumber Heights and a 33 year resident okay. of the Town of Thumber Heights. Yeah. Uh, my name is Larry Harrison. I'm a third generation uh, resident of Thumber Heights. Good one. Okay. And Hi, I'm Ashley Atwell. I'm a three year resident of Thumber Heights, New York resident. Okay. I'm George Short. I'm a resident. Okay. Right across the street. Right across the street. Good. 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 Okay. Good seeing people that are right across the street. Okay. So let's start up on this side. Okay. Council member. Council member Kirsten Leftwich, Town of Fairmont Heights. Um, 
lifelong resident of the town um, for, not to say my age, uh, 44 years. <laughs> Okay. Daisy Capers, uh, founder of Fairmont Heights Community Development Corporation, which is a 501c3. I'm J.D. Martin, the husband of the former mayor of Fairmont Heights. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. I I am Lily Thompson Martin, uh, all around public servant for the town of Fairmount Heights. Yes. Okay, okay, so on the back row. Sure, my name is Pamela Falker, and I'm also with PEPCO. I work with um, Senator M. Okay, okay. Hi, Renita Flood Bennett, Director of Fairmount Heights Community Development Corporation. Welcome, thank you. Oh, we are here. Yeah. <laughs> I'm Ricardo Hurst. Um, 34 year resident here. Okay. And love this town. Okay. okay. Uh, Kevin Thomas, let's say the show right from Yeah, we're happy that uh, Kevin's obviously the representative. And I also want to thank him on the town for new, but he's been flashing our micro grid project. So Absolutely. I send him thank you. Uh, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, my name is Rosa McCray. I'm a 20 years resident of Fairmont Heights. Okay. I'm the okay. 60th resident. And, and especially, I'm not going to say this is Michael Kent's resume. I'll let him tell you a little bit about himself. And, and I'm going to incorporate you um, as a program a little bit because you're a little bit talking about your connection to Fairmont Heights and historic preservation. Hey, my name is Michael Kent. I'm a former member of the Maryland Commission for African American History and Culture. I'm currently on the Calvert County Historic Preservation Commission. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. Okay, so, so Mr. Morris, uh, while we attend to a few of the housekeeping and bring out lunch, I'm gonna let you get started. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Sarumi. Uh, it's said that until the lions have their own historians, tales of the hunt will always glorify the hunters. I provided some information when I was uh, town manager to um, Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission. Uh, and I turned around and looked, and it was in print. <laughs> uh, I had several conversations with them and many conversations with people in the town. And they have uh, convinced me to start writing down some of my uh, memories, which is not as good as it used to be, but uh, I'll just have to live with it. Okay, growing up in Fremont Heights uh, provided a wealth of experiences and memories. When the opportunity to share a few was presented during Black History Month celebrations in town, or in casual conversations with old and several new residents, some told me to write some down. In several conversations, I just mentioned this. Uh, several other recent publications and captions on pictures in the town contain some misinformation, which I felt duty bound to correct. Much of the information about the town has gone unrecorded, and if it's not put in print somewhere, <clears throat> excuse me, it might be lost. The old safe in the town hall was ruined by rain, leaking in before the roof finally collapsed and the building was demolished. In that vein, uh, I've heard on the side, side of caution and probably put information in this piece. This is a draft of a book I'm attempting to write. It's driving my wife crazy. <laughs> okay. Uh, but uh, there are my recollections and uh, hopefully will be reviewed, refined, and corrected by those with more and better memories. My brother Warren and I have been accused of knowing where all the bodies are buried in Fremont Heights. Okay. Uh, we do not. <laughs> uh, we do know where the remains of several pets are buried, but we only know of two human remains. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Levy had stillborn twins. And with the support of the town and the approval of the county, the, they were allowed to bury them in the backyard of their home on 60th Place. And when we were kids, we would walk 
through the alley to look at where the indentations were. Scared the heck out of us, okay? Townsend Buddy Lucas, the younger brother of th uh, two of the th four Tuskegee Airmen from Fremont Heights, interviewed my father, my uncle, and others for a history of the town he was writing called Conversations and Memories of Fremont Heights. A copy of his typewritten draft was given to each of the persons he interviewed and to the Fremont Heights Library. Um, which has lost its copy. Um, on that, the plaques that were on the monument grounds that contained all the names of all of the World War II veterans were taken off of the monument because they were being damaged by kids throwing rocks and everything. They were polished, framed, and provided to the library for safekeeping. They're gone. Okay. The basement flooded. A contractor came in and cleaned up. They're lost. Our hope is that the photographer who was there that day can be identified, or at least his office, and that there are clear enough pictures of those uh, plaques that we can use to retrieve the names of the people who served in World War II. <clears throat> uh, Buggy had this draft, and luckily my sister found a copy in my father's effects, and I have that copy. And if I can get this finished, it will be included in total. Okay. He had some information that he wanted to publish, but he didn't want to publish it because of the nature of the information. It's humorous but it might have upset a couple of folks. So he had planned on waiting for everybody mentioned uh, in that vein to die. And then he was going to publish it and put it all out in the street. Unfortunately, he didn't check with the good Lord, and he went before several of them. Okay? <laughs> but we do have his book. And he also uh, did something with a national historical group. Uh, about the, uh, the town's uh, architecture, okay? Fremont Heights initially provided a safe harbor for African Americans in search of homes for their families, which provided uh, reliable municipal services. It was composed of land from at least five farms. Originally, and the lots were marketed to whites, but their lack of interest resulted in a business decision to sell to blacks. Some of the earliest settlers moved to the town because of the lack of services provided by the government of the District of Columbia. They built a variety of homes, from shotgun designs and modest single-story frame or cinder block bungalows to more grand architecture. Some of each type survive to this day. Several entrepreneurs built duplexes and apartment buildings. Walter Mars, Mr. Steele, my father, uh, Wesley King, and Cody Spriggs. Several others built single-family designs uh, on adjacent and or widely dispersed lots. Mayor Campbell, Mayor Campbell. Now, all of these guys, I, I knew about these guys, but I knew all of these, starting from here. Okay. Um, uh, let's see. Neighbors could be relied upon to help each other with construction and renovation projects in the evenings after work and on weekends. The firehouse, the Old Town Hall, was constructed, wired, and plumbed by townsfolk working together and donating material. It included a public space on the second floor for plays, concerts, dances, parties, town meetings, and community, community gatherings of all sorts. It was later enlarged to include a credit union, library, and town offices, and police department. Mm -hmm. Several Sears and Roebuck packaged homes were also constructed, the best known and maintained being Prince Washington's house on Eastern Avenue. Several residents built and lived in their basements with tar paper roofs, adding second stories and pitched roofs when resources became available. Two remained unfinished on 56th place until they were demolished in the mid-60s. One on 58th place survived until this century. But most of the houses in town had outhouses and many had wells and many families raised poultry and livestock for sale and consumption. The town was nurtured, has nurtured a virtual symphony of achievements by its sons and daughters, providing a supportive climate that developed a plethora of gro grocers, craftsmen, equipment operators, and truckers, 
barbers, shoe repairmen, hairdressers, seamstresses, police officers, firemen, and other government workers. The town has produced a Methodist bishop. Bishop, bishop. Uh, medical doctors and dentists, the first black justice of the peace in the state, the first black Prince George's County School Board member, the first black member of the board and later chairman of the Washington Suburban Sanitation Commission, Mr. Mayor Brooks, uh, Lawrence Brooks, not related to Doswell, okay? Numerous federal and state executives, managers, and administrators, a Rhodes Scholar and manager of the New York and New Jersey Port Authority, a nationally recognized cancer researcher, a professor of psychology, several authors, a Harvard MBA, numerous elementary and high school teachers and principals, a chief of staff of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, an associate administrator of the Federal Highway Administration, numerous merchants and other business owners and managers, and White House staff members, four Tuskegee Airmen, and a member of the gradu first graduating class of Tuskegee's Inst Tuskegee Institute's Veterinary School, and a circuit court judge, first black state's attorney, juvenile master, district and circuit court judge, whose brother was the first black Maryland state trooper, who ran marathons in every state and on every continent, including Antarctica. A Vietnam era fighter pilot who became one of the first black commercial airline pilots a strategic air command pilot who flew B-47s, B-52s, and C-130s, and numerous soldiers, sailors, Marines, airmen, and National Guard members, commissioned officers, non-commissioned officers, and enlisted veterans in every war and military engagement in which our nation has been involved since and including World War I. Because of the likelihood that citizens were or might become employed by the federal government, Fremont Heights is specifically excluded from the provisions of the Hatch Act. Appointed and elected positions in the town have provided qualifying experience, <clears throat> training, exposure for incumbents, equipping them to assume more responsible positions in the town and their chosen careers. I'm going to jump back and forth through here because I know I'm not going to have time to go through it all. Uh, and Ms. Sarumi and or my wife will tell me when to stop talking, <laughs> okay? The Fremont Heights Tuskegee Institute uh, connection. I will begin with four Tuskegee Airmen, Wendell Lucas, Elliot Lucas, both of whom were awarded the Bronze Star after their actions in Italy. And William Stevenson, whose family is still involved with the Tuskegee Airmen uh, Association, and Charles Francis, who wrote the book, The Tuskegee Airmen. He lived at 5909 K Street, right beside my grandfather. And great man, and uh, very humble, but uh, Mr. Francis and his brother didn't get along, <laughs> to brother Francis, and uh, their house went to rack and ruin. That's happened to three families that I know of in the town, where the children of parents who labored long and hard to build their houses, the kids couldn't sit down at a table with a lawyer if necessary and come to an agreement on what to do. Three houses in town have collapsed to the ground, okay? And several of these folks are well-educated, but, but this is being filmed, so I can't, <laughs> can't say what I was going to say. But um, they need to have uh, surgery. Yeah. Shut up, Morris. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> okay. Uh, our mom's cousin, uh, her, Gertrude was her name. Her husband was Alfred Chief Anderson. And there's a picture of him back there. He's the one who took uh, Eleanor Roosevelt up on her first airplane ride. In uh, the Tuskegee Airmen film on HBO, they have a student taking her up. It didn't happen. Uh, he took her up. And um, 45 years after he trained the Tuskegee Airmen, 
he and General B.O. Davis were invited to the Air and Space Museum to be recognized for the work that they did 45 years previously. Better late than never. Okay. And Eleanor Roosevelt, I guess everybody knows, came to Sylvan Vista Church when they were building Chapel Oaks. Okay. Uh, John Davis lived on J Street, uh, 5705 J Street. He advertised on his truck that he was a Tuskegee craftsman. He was a licensed electricity and he wired most of the houses in town. Portia Washington Pittman, the daughter of Booker T. Washington and her husband, William Sidney Pittman, the architect of their now demolished home on Eastern Avenue and the first school for African-American children in Prince George's County on 61st Avenue and Addison Road. They hosted Booker T. Washington at their home before Booker T.'s meeting, Booker T. and Portia, before they met at a dinner uh, at the White House with President Franklin Roosevelt. Her ne nephew, in his autobiography, uh, described her as his favorite aunt, whom he visited often. While we can't prove it now, it's highly likely that James Baldwin visited the town of Fairmont Heights. Okay. Um, wait a minute. I mentioned Charles Francis. Okay, I did. Okay, so I'm just going to flip through here. And there's some people that I want to mention, but there's some things too. Kenilworth Avenue Bridge. When Kenilworth Avenue was two lanes, there was a bridge that went across, a two-lane bridge that went across the creek down there by uh, the junkyard. Okay. Um, and until the bridge, it's, it had corrugated steel panels on the side of the bridge. I have no idea why, because anybody crazy enough to walk across that bridge or throw a rock would be hit by a car. But every morning in the summertime, when we slept with the windows open, uh, before we even had a fan, <laughs> okay, waiting for a breeze <laughs> and flipping that pillow till you can find a cool spot, okay? He would, uh, every morning between 6 and 6.30, people would be leaving from Bladensburg going into D.C. And people from D.C. would be going out to Bladensburg to go to work between 6 and 6.30 every morning. And you could hear that bridge rattle all the way up here to Fairmont Heights. Okay. And that would be our alarm clock. Okay. Uh, Billy Goat Mountain. Have you ever heard of Billy Goat Mountain? Yeah. You yeah? have? No. Okay. Between Addison Road and Beaver Dam, on what was once the site of Fairfield Farms Kitchens and now the site of a new apartment complex across the street from Addison Chapel Apartments, there was a very large and imposing hill we all called Billy Goat Mountain. It was covered with thick deciduous forests and had small animals like rabbits, raccoons, possums, snakes, turtles, frogs, and all manner of birds and bugs, including ticks and mosquitoes. It was laced with paths worn by the feet of any number of generations of cowboys and Indians and a few Tarzans running willy-nilly and occasionally bumping into one another. The mountain belonged to all who visited it and it was free fun for years until the big yellow things came and they started tearing that mountain down, making it level so they could build Fairfield Farms Kitchen. But before they did it, we would sit and watch all this heavy equipment and then all the workers would go home and we would get on the heavy grip, <laughs> climbed all over. <laughs> Couldn't find a way to start it, didn't have a key. But uh, every day they changed that mountain. And we would go over there sometimes at night when the moon was out and go running around, still having a good time on all the paths that we knew. Sometimes the paths were cut in half and one night <laughs> three of us went running and the path wasn't there. And we looked like, uh, you know, Donald Duck or Wally e. Coyote, except we didn't stop in midair. As soon as we left the trail, we were flying. And I'm thinking, oh, God. And we rolled down the hill. And that stopped us going over there. Didn't go over there anymore. <laughs> OK. Uh, the overwhelming majority of residents of Fairman Heights, Cedar Heights, Jefferson Heights, and Chapel Oaks, and North Englewood 
rode streetcars to and from their jobs and usually got off the streetcars at 61st and Dick Street in D.C. There was a standard drugstore and a DGS, district grocery store, privately owned, but affiliated with affiliated uh, groceries throughout the city, all of which were painted orange and green. They would walk to their homes by the most direct routes through town, and from spring to fall, many would sing the most popular songs of the times in three, four-part harmonies from the time they left the streetcar until they got home. And we would be laying there in the house with the windows open, and the people would be walking from the streetcars singing, and some were pretty good. And every now and then, somebody in the group would try to get them changed to another song, but be overridden by <laughs> more people singing louder, okay? Uh, but we would wait for the, uh, they would begin to fade as they got up by Mr. King's apartment and then past Lucille Gibbons' house, Lucille Smith and Mrs. Gibbons' house, and drop down to Addison Road. And we'd wait for the next load of streetcar passengers to get our next live free musical performance. Uh, between the songs, there'd be laughing and joking, and sometimes several in the group would attempt to mention that that started. But the first TV in town, first TV in town, First TV I ever saw was my rich uncle Douglas. He had a TV with a screen like this, six inch diagonal. And we saw the uh, inauguration of uh, Harry S. Truman. Okay, my father was looking at that TV and he said it would have been easy to see the whole thing just we'd driven down to Pennsylvania Avenue to <laughs> watch the career. Okay, but the first um, TV we ever saw in town was uh, bought by Mr. and Mrs. Jackson who lived on 60th Avenue, Mrs. Evelyn Jackson. She, had, she was a clerk in the federal government, and she had enough money to buy television. And the first week she had it, she invited all the kids in the neighborhood to come in and watch. And we couldn't get enough of it, because there was only like three or four channels, and it only stayed on a couple hours a day, OK? But she got tired of us quick. <laughs> So she said we couldn't come in anymore, but she did let us sit on the porch, and she had a French door, and she rolled the shade up, and we could look at the TV. Okay. And Mr. Jackson liked looking at Ed Sullivan because he had dancing girls, and he could look at their legs. I remember that. Mars? Yes. Okay. That's it. I'm going to have to wait for Jeffy. Would Jeffy fan? A lot of good Jeffy questions. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Mrs. Sarumi. It is such a pleasure to come back in here today and see all of our displays of historic information that have been here. And we were just piecing these items together. But I want to say thanks especially to the Morris family for all that you've contributed. Because if it hadn't been for you all stepping in, bringing us these items, like you said, the scatterings and the the things that would never have been recognized for the town of Fairmont Heights, it would have never happened. And this is what we, we really appreciate, things that where people are giving back to us as a community. It is so much graciousness involved in doing that. So we want to say thank you. I am not in the position to give you anything official, but coming from my mouth, I say thank you. Yes. And I want to say thank you also to Ms. Sarumi for organizing this day, because the importance of a black history program for a historic town like Fairmont Heights can never be diminished. We need this, and we need to keep it going, because it's vital. And what I did, I just wrote down a few items, because you know my mind is always working, and it's so full of information I started off when I walked through that door and I saw those lovely display cases. They are beautiful. They are beautiful. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about my personal story and why I was here at Fairmont Heights working for 32 years or more just for that purpose, just to make the historic nature of this town never be diminished. Never. 
So I had written out a few, few words here I want to share with you. And I'm saying good day to all of our residents and friends and happy last day of Black History Month. I am retired Mayor Lily Thompson Martin and I do have a story to tell. As the lead of my grandfather, Mr. William Bill Thompson, our family moved to the town of Fairmont Heights in the early 50s from Weldon, North Carolina. My grandfather, who was a sharecropper on the Hargrove Plantation, scraped and saved enough money to purchase a house from the Heinz Real Estate Company in Fairmont Heights. This property was a family one that would allow anyone in the family who needed housing to stay. That house was 1008 60th Avenue, and that is where all of our memories were made. We learned the real meaning of life and love from that address. Because of segregation, we were all routed to Fairmont Heights Elementary School and Fairmont Heights High School because middle schools were not provided for us. We spent junior and senior high school at our beloved Fairmont Heights High School. From grades seven through 12, we loved it. There was such an atmosphere of love, fellowship, and learning, and the teachers poured all of their hearts and knowledge right into us. We will be forever grateful for their hard work and dedication our historic days in Fairmont Heights were shaped with dirt roads, non-existent sidewalks, and every imaginable portion of poverty known, but we made it. The spirit that ran through us in this town was the thread that held us together. We were black and we were proud. One activity that we always looked forward to was the Friday night canteen, where we could dance all of our troubles away. We really enjoyed the company of our peers. The neighbors of Fairmont Heights laid the foundation for us becoming strong, happy adults, and we will continue to praise their fortitude. Another sincere value of our ancestors was a desire to serve the community. One of our mayors, Mayor Doswell Brooks, and his wife purchased the first bus for students right here in Fairmont Heights. We were represented on the WSSC board, the school board, and banded together to build our own old town hall on 60th place. None of the ancestors who volunteered asked for anything in return. They gave so that we could remain sustainable. We have held the wagon in the Fairmont Heights Road for years and years, and the time has arrived for some final work of our town Main Street on Sheriff Road. That Main Street would be an area that we could call our own. Our time has come. Our legacies are tied to what will be constructed for the future. The Net Zero Project will be an excellent addition to our status in the county and state, but a dynamic Main Street that will fulfill our long-awaited dream of Fairmont Heights as our historic landmark will be a major force to be dealt with, and it will again allow us to have our name written in stone. Let's do it for the children. And working along with the Fairmont Heights CDC, we are Fairmont Heights, our roots run deep, and they run wide. Thank you all for listening. Mayor Martin for those amazing remarks and reminders. As I said earlier, yesterday, this way, tomorrow is a new day and a new history. So having said that, I'm going to now turn um, to Mr. Michael Kent. Um, if you want to give us a few remarks, um, concerning Fairmont Heights, you are involved with historic preservation as it relates to uh, town, as in uh, uh, and Mr. Um, Ken's very humble. He's an author. I said that as an attorney. He's contributed to a lot of information and preservation of the historic city of Maryland. 
Good afternoon. I, I didn't know I was going to be asked to speak, so I didn't prepare anything. Um, the immediate connection that I was just talking about that I have with uh, this area is that my family was originally owned uh, by the governor of Maryland in the 1820s, Joseph Kent. And Joseph Kent was born in Lower Marlboro in Calvert County. But uh, after the War of 1812, and he became a governor, he started living here in Prince George's County, even though his family and almost 30-some slaves, including my family members, were back in Calvert County in Lower Marlboro. For some reason, he preferred you guys in Prince George's County and stayed here and started his, uh, a large plantation here. And then when his, he passed away, his family members, his descendants, decided they liked Prince George's County better than Calvert County. And so therefore, they sold off all their property, including their slaves, which included my family, to another slaveholder named James King, a little farther down the river, but still in Calvert County. Uh, James King was on a, a wharf called King's Landing that he owned. He had, back then, it was considered a small farm. He only had like 12,000 acres. So a little bit of land, so he, d he did have need for some, some extra help. But he also, he had his family, his white family, wife and kids. But he fathered three children by my great-great-grandmother, Susan, after he purchased her in that slave auction from the governor. As a result of that, uh, the, the children that he uh, fathered with her uh, had some twinge of guilt, I think, around 1850. He gave her her freedom. and. Out of that 12,000 acres, he generously gave her 25 acres with her freedom. But that's where my family started, and that's still where they are today. They eventually, over time, expanded that uh, 25 acres up to 500 acres and continued there pretty much the same area. Uh, the majority of my family is still in that uh, King's Landing area of Calvert County. And my father, and that was his side of the family that it came from, married Again, another Calvin County resident, my mother and her family had been there generations as well. So as I was saying, yeah, it was a small county up through 1960. The entire population, black and white, uh, was just over 12,500 in 1960, okay? So you figure everybody back then was having, again, small families, 12 to 18 kids. Uh, so it's, it's hard. <laughs> It's hard with that, and you know, you've got a total population of 12,000. It's hard not to be related to just about everybody else there, black or white, as your cousin. Yeah. So, and that's one of the things they told us as we were growing up, you know, don't get involved with anybody from Calvert County, because more than likely it's your cousin. <laughs> but we're doing some of the same research you guys have been doing here. We're talking about in the historic uh, preservation, getting more black property into historic preservation. And we found, found the same thing in Calvert County as you did here, is that a lot of the, uh, the black families will immediately renovate their property. They make changes. Um, and I did a lot of oral histories, and that's where the book came from. Mulatto is talking to people, uh, the older generations, um, about why things happened, why they didn't change. They didn't want to remember the past. Those, those were not good times, as Trump keeps saying, make America great, and they keep saying, when was it great for us? So they didn't want to remember that. They wanted to make the changes to see something new. As far as why not just move away, there was a connection there, too, not just because it was farmland or the water with the uh, fishing and things to do. It was because of the family. Um, the British came through Calvert and, and actually here as well in 1814 uh, on their way to the White House to burn it down, which they did successfully. And they offered freedom to a lot of blacks here and in, um, here in Prince George's County and Calvert County. And a lot refused to leave. And the reason they didn't leave is, uh, again, their family. They knew where they were. They were enslaved and they knew where they were. They had a lot of family members taken away and sold somewhere and they didn't know where. Their idea was, and they were correct, once slavery ends, they may have an idea of how to get back to me. I have no way of finding where they are, so let's stay put and have some idea of how to make that connection later on down the line. Um, and they also, again, like my family, had been enslaved for several generations, and they saw there were ways out of slavery without running away with somewhere, uh, to some other location. Uh, I don't know what the main 
crop here was in uh, Prince George's County, I'm, what the main industry was. I know it was tobacco in Calvert. It was tobacco in Calvert, which was very hard work, very hard labor. And uh, this is without any equipment, no tractors, no nothing modern. You were doing everything by hand. So they were pretty much worn out by age 40. So they would often be given their freedom at age 40 just because the uh, owner wasn't going to get the productive work out of them that they could with the younger person. And it was just cheaper for them to give them their freedom rather than to hold on to them and feed, uh, and feed them. So that was one way of just waiting around until you aged out of slavery. Okay, So it wasn't like I had to run away or have to do this. A lot of people also bought their way out by working other jobs and bought their way out of uh, slavery that way. So there were other options rather than just running away, which I would assume would have been the same thing here where people would stay. And again, it had to do with family coming back. Even during the 1920s after uh, you guys started this uh, Fairmont Heights here, the reason people would not leave the area, move to someplace else, most people couldn't read or write at that time, especially the older people couldn't read or write. So if you left and moved to a different area, that was the end of all contact with your family. And that was too much for the black families to give up, is to have that contact uh, with other family members. So that's why you stay in the same area. Um, I have to give people, and well, during these oral histories, the uh, information that was always coming back to me from the, uh, the older people, and I was saying before, you, it's a good thing to live in this area. You do live a long time. Uh, because my father was uh, born in 1914. He lived to be 100. Uh, his grandfather, who was born enslaved in 1836, lived until the 1930s. So my father got to spend a lot of time talking to him and other people that had been enslaved and passed this information down to me as well that I, I pass on the oral histories. Um, it was always about family and what, what the next connection was going to be and what I could do. And I see this with all the people you have on the walls here, what I could do for the next generation. If I can't do it, let me put things in place uh, as far as education or whatever so that the next person could do it. Um, and Calvert, uh, we got our first high school in uh, 1939, William Sampson Brooks High School. Uh, what year did the high school come here? Fairmont. 1950. 1950, okay, it's around the same time period. Uh, yeah, so the only way you could get an education beyond the seventh grade at that time was to go to Washington or to Baltimore. So just a lot of families spent years with uh, saving money to send a child or two to high school to get that better opportunity uh, to preserve it. And I see back there you have uh, Judge Taylor. Uh, I remember Judge Taylor, uh, I was a state's attorney in Prince George's County for a while when he was still on the circuit court at the end of his career in the 1980s. Uh, and he was so well respected there at that time, it was amazing. But that's the, the few connections I have. I don't want to take all your time, connections I have to Fairmont. Uh, and this is just a wonderful community. I'm so happy that you invited me to come here today. Thank you. like to thank all of my guests. I hope that you've enjoyed the presentations. A lot of good information, a lot of reflections. Uh, as Mayor Mark said in January, I'm glad and I'm proud. There's so many things that we can be proud of. Uh, one, of one of the things that really bothered me uh, today, and you hear it all the time, uh, referring to the District of Columbia, the city under siege. But they do not talk about all the young people who live in the District of Columbia, who graduated, or who've gone on to Howard, who's done great things, who's gone on to Harvard, who've done great things. So let no one define your destination as it's related to your race. Let's all leave here enlightened. Thank you for coming. Uh, thank all of our guests. Thank you, Mr. Ken. I always enjoy that presentation, always. Thank you for representing Congressman Ivy's office. Thank you. Uh, and so this concludes the end of our program. Thank you. Thank you.